Well, good evening, everyone. He's just loading up the uh, slides. There's only 85 slides to go through in 30 minutes, so it's going to be fantastic, right? No worries, no worries. So uh, I'll give you a bit of a background. The idea for this talk came out of uh, two particular things. I used to do Toastmasters uh, to try to improve my speaking skills, but also last year I was in Sofia, Bulgaria, and I got put on a ladies' panel. And I was uh, number four chair, so the last person to speak. The first chair was a, a man, and he was describing how his daughter could never be in the security industry because all she wanted to do was to be a princess. And I responded back when it was my turn, and I go, well, isn't that interesting? I used to be a princess, and now I'm a poet star. And <laughs> so I, I decided to have fun with it and try to uh, do, this is my first like non-technical talk, uh, but to describe the diversity that is absolutely needed, whether you're a man, you're a woman, no matter what color you are, no matter if you're eight, handy capable or not, and what type of background you come from. So, yes, all right. So I've got a pretty slide. All right, so, thank you so much. I'm just gonna sit up there. I'll pretend that it'll actually work. So to give you a bit of background, I do a lot of stuff in cyber warfare, but I also do uh, blue teaming, but also a lot of red teaming. So I like to say that I uh, use technology to kill people, or advise how not to use technology to kill people, <laughs> right? So I had a very odd beginning where um, when I was 10, I unfortunately got busted hacking to the Department of Justice and could not use a computer again until I was 18 years old. And that was a bit problematic because I love computers. Now one of the reasons why is uh, half of my family comes from this tiny little island which was made famous by Donald Trump giving us aid by throwing us a couple of rolls of paper towels recently. Uh, that's not a particularly nice story. Uh, my mom was, she was a single mom and she came to the mainland United States and had me and she was very much into mathematics but unfortunately because of will say, the culture of Puerto Rico, women are highly discouraged of doing anything with science, technology, engineering, or mathematics completely. And this was a bit difficult because she really wanted to do this, she really wanted to go to university. So she ended up working for a company that doesn't exist anymore, it's called Digital Corporation, and now it's Particule Packard. And she uh, started becoming a robotics programmer on industrial lines, uh, manufacturing cars at places like Ford and General Motors and so forth. So she broke that mold uh, from certain family beliefs and helped enable me to do that. And she was very much a role model. And I was also uh, very pleased with the fact that I had a great grandfather and great uncle who were in the t intelligence community. And they mentored me quite a bit. Uh, teaching me all sorts of things. Like, before I started school, uh, my great-grandfather goes, all right, I'm gonna teach you a Caesar cipher, and that way, your notes pass them back and forth, the teacher will never be able to decipher them, right? So you'll be able to meet people and have fun. And so it was a great way uh, to be mentored, both from my mother and from my great-grandfather and great-uncle. So, unfortunately, there were some members of my family that, that is not a picture of me. Uh, <laughs> I know that was different. Uh, there were some members of my family that uh, still did not believe that women should be in STEM whatsoever. And just before I got busted hacking with computers, um, some of my family decided they were going to make me into a beauty queen. And I was like, no, I like football, I like wrestling, I like karate, and they're like, no, we gotta groom you for a rich husband. I'm like, no! <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, uh, they put a lot of makeup on me, and high heels for tots, I don't know, I, mean, I don't know, I, I, I seriously don't understand that one, and a swimsuit, so uh, one of the good things that came out of this was after having to parade around uh, from a very early age until the time I was a teen uh, in a swimsuit getting judged by all sorts of people, uh, I lost my fear of public speaking. Because <laughs> I've already faced some weird things dealing with it. But this was probably my least favorite portion of my particular life. But it does show you that you can start from various places and you can become whatever you want to be. 
So when I was uh, able to use a computer again, uh, the U.S. Air Force recruited me, and they gave me this thing called a moral waiver to be able to join the Air Force because of my juvenile record. <laughs> Whoops. And uh, because I only missed one question out of this military entrance exam called the ASVAB, I could pick any job I wanted, and they had just allowed women in aviation enlisted to be able to join up. So I ended up being the third woman in that particular field. And I was on this really big plane. And what I did was I was the flying calculator, so to speak, as well as physical security on the ground and a ground commander. So a load master has to position all of this different cargo into different places. If it's hazardous and you're having a problem, you've got to push it off, right? Get rid of it uh, so you don't land and blow up. So that's always a bad thing. We don't want to do that. Um, and this plane is the largest plane in the US Air Force's inventory. From ground to the top of the tail, it's six stories high. It's as big as a football pitch inside, and it can weigh 998,000 pounds during wartime for takeoff. That's a really big plane. You can also load planes on the plane, which is kind of cool, right? <laughs> so after I was entered in the line of duty, because this was a combat uh, position, <laughs> Space Force, I said, oh my god, I almost said it, Space Command was like, hey, how are you doing? And I'm like, well, hey, why not? So I ended up going to the super secret squirrel location, which uh, Edward Snowden revealed. But, uh, <laughs> and I worked in a SOC, but it was a different type of SOC. It was a space operations center. And what we were responsible for was, what can I say on Wikipedia? So visibility of the world to basically make sure that nobody, a rogue nation, uh, tested out uh, a nuclear weapon, for example. <coughs> and so we could see certain things, and that's all I can say about it. But they left me uh, with this very interesting project, and it's my favorite project ever from the US government, name-wise. It's called HEMP. Does anybody know what it might stand for? Because we're dealing with space, right? Hardening against electromagnetic pulse. Right? Because uh, there's all sorts of solar weather, and you want to protect your uh, visibility, so you have to figure out where to put your satellites, position them, if they have no propulsion, and so forth. So I did that for a while, and that was kind of fun. Uh, and also through it, uh, I also had to do this thing. This is called Search, Evasion, Rescue, and Escape. If any of you have ever seen this old movie called G.I. Jane, she was in the Navy. Uh, part of the Marines. Uh, the U.S. Air Force was the one who came up with this, so I had to go through A, B, C, and D. Uh, so all of them, because I was a, a high-risk uh, person for kidnap and all sorts of things. So I did all sorts of fun stuff, like tracing around in the forest, and yeah, not taking a shower for two weeks. No, right? So uh, women can do anything that they want. So after the military, I ended up moving to Europe. And I started getting into psycho warfare because I'd already had a background with psycho warfare dealing with space command and dealing with nation state attacks and so forth. So back in 2009, I was able to discover uh, there was a three wave attack against South Korea caused by the North Koreans. What they did was they installed a bunch of malware during the second wave called W32 Dozer. And they took advantage of computers here in London, the high speed bandwidth, as well as certain areas of Europe and the high-performance computers. And over 168,000 systems were infected, and I was able to see some of the infections and in all of these different computers and systems uh, actually aimed towards the South Korean infrastructure. So uh, I was able to use my network from networking at places like this, and events like this, uh, definitely from you know, OWASP conferences and so forth, to call up people at uh, national level certs, ISPs, and so forth, to ask them to start shutting down the traffic so that uh, we didn't actually take over the South Korean infrastructure and take it out. And what became interesting about this one was it was soon after a whole bunch of banks here in the United Kingdom and elsewhere in Europe were bailed out by various governments. So inadvertently, one of these things was from Lloyd's TSB, and they had been partially owned by the UK government. And so one of the ways I got them to shut their stuff down was this actually might be a case of cyber warfare, even though it is not your quote unquote fault that you're infected with malware, you're still aiming your stuff at another country's infrastructure and you're partially owned by the UK government. 
So this is putting you in a very sticky situation. So uh, after they realized the uh, risk, uh, they actually shut off a lot of those systems and started cleaning them up. Uh, I used to do a lot of work back and forth because uh, I was one of their uh, security experts uh, working for another company but advising both Lloyd's TSB, the market trading division, and all of Danone's infrastructure, the big dairy manufacturer based out of Paris, and also dealing with their industrial control systems and their robotics factories and so forth. Now, in 2012, uh, things started heating up uh, because uh, we like to say the genie is out of the bottle with a particular attack called Stuxnet against the Iranian government to slow down their uh, nuclear enrichment, uranium enrichment. And soon after, um, there was a post on, or a pasty on Pastebin. Uh, fortunately, uh, nobody was looking at it, and the pasty said, hey, we're angry. We know that there's blood on your hands, all these horrible governments, because it was also the tail end of uh, Arab Spring. And we're going to go after the company that funds the Saudi Arabian government, and that's called Saudi Aramco. Now, how many of you have heard of Saudi Aramco? Yes! And for the ones that haven't, it is the world's most valuable company. Uh, trillions. On top of which, uh, about 25% of the world's energy goes through them every single day. Now, we've heard of recent attacks where there were rocket and missile launches against uh, Saudi Aramco infrastructure, some drones laden with uh, some explosives, that's never a good thing, and they had to actually uh, cut down their oil production by 5%. Now, when this attack hit, uh, they actually uh, had over 35,000 computers wiped out within a two-hour time period and 85% of their Windows infrastructure. So how many of you think that your company could recover from something like that? Right? Kind of expensive. It was quite expensive. And um, I did not apply for the position because I already had another job. But they called me up out of the blue and were like, hey, we'd like you to come in and set up digital security teams and reestablish international business. Uh, connectivity. Now it's like, hey, I'm thinking it's a prank call, maybe a scam call. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't contact them. And so they asked me to name my price, which I just Shh, don't tell. Them. Pick something out of the air. And so uh, shortly thereafter, I was contacted again. They said, well, we've convened the board. We've matched your price. We've given you a raise on top of that, and we want you to start as soon as possible. And I was like, uh oh. Uh, this is the most powerful board in the world. And then I had to add in, I know I go by Chris. I know I have a deep voice. But you do know I'm a lady Chris, right? Because <laughs> I thought it was very unusual that I was given this opportunity by a country and a company that most people would not think would want to give opportunities to women. But on the contrary, they did. And uh, they gave a lot of opportunities. The majority of software developers at Saudi Aramco are women. Uh, the reason being is uh, there are some people who think that petroleum engineering is top, but uh, women can do all of the back office. So what happens is all of the dev work, almost all women. And they can, uh, if they have a problem with genders, that's not a problem at all. And uh, it's a unique thing in the Middle East uh, that most of the software developers are women throughout the Middle East. Yeah. Way more. Way, way more. So, uh, since all of this has occurred, I had shared with a, a couple people before the talk, uh, over the past four years, I unfortunately got a very bad infection in East Africa, so I've been in a lot of surgeries. I've only been able to work full time since June, and while I was still in and out of a wheelchair, I ended up writing this book uh, because it was something that you could do at home and didn't require travel when I was in and out of hospital. So it was this particular career field for me has been invaluable when I have not been able to leave the house. And uh, some of the things I've been doing since, in this particular book, it talks about uh, the Panama Papers law firm. Because I decided in between going into hospital for major surgery, I would uh, write up uh, ways for the ICIJ to be able to get even more data from Monseca Fonseca and write them a 40-page how-to workbook just for them. 
because I don't particularly like corruption. So uh, this uh, details a lot of that, as well as a few other things, because I just don't like it. Uh, since then, uh, in between surgeries, I was able to help lead the EU NATO cyber warfare exercises in Brussels. And that was very interesting because one of the scenarios actually involved London, where uh, the major scenario of, uh, well, we'll say loss of life, was hacking into the signaling system of the London Underground and causing collisions during rush hour. So these are the types of things that governments are thinking and scenarios that they're uh, considering. And I love the fact that they bring me in as both Lady Chris, right? Um, but also value uh, my technical expertise and knowledge. And when I was living in the United States, this isn't too slight off the US, I did not have those opportunities there. Women do not have equal rights in the United States. We do not have a right to have equal pay. And the opportunities are very limited. Uh, the culture, uh, even though uh, organizations like OWASP try to open this stuff up, the culture and um, STEM is still a bit hostile. They're hostile against sometimes women, hostile against someone who could be mixed race. I'm half Puerto Rican, half Czech. Uh, so I am not considered white in the United States. Uh, because, I don't know, they're crazy. Um, so, I had a huge amount of opportunities here, and I've been loving it because I would never in my right mind think that I could be hired on as the CTO of a US company, and here a Saudi company that we based mostly out of Europe, and I was in that function. Uh, in the meantime, I hate corruption, so I uh, will probably be putting in a talk. Uh, last year when Armenia went on strike, I was able to prove uh, that a uh, corrupt uh, multi-level marketing scam dealing with Bitcoin uh, cloud mining had actually bribed the Armenian Prime Minister 270,000 euros to appear in photos and pretend that the world's largest Bitcoin mining farm would be opening up in Armenia. Did you guys hear about that? I did. <laughs> <Isn't> it, <right? laughs> yeah, I gotta invest now. Invest now. Um, most recently, I'm um, also in touch with uh, Equifax. Equifax is a credit reporting agency that also operates here. And I've been in a bit of a fight with their BISO the last week, because that's how I work. And they've got a lot of problems, though. So. Uh, and today, most of my time has been taken up dealing with Boeing. Uh, next week, I will be giving a talk, double check the time, uh, on Boeing uh, for a talk at an aviation security conference called More Than Turbulence. And it's actually about all of the aviation industry, the fact that I was able to get to ticketing systems directly, into luggage systems, into air traffic control systems, and also in the case of Boeing, um, which they have not been happy about, I will tell you quite honestly, um, I was able to bypass authentication because of coding errors into uh, flight control software areas for all sorts of things, because nowadays, a plane and a satellite, they're all driven by software. And that's something that we have to think about. They are no longer an aircraft manufacturer, they are an IT uh, business who happens to manufacture airplanes. And that's the way our world is going. Trains are going that way. Our public transport systems, they are just, well, they're massive IT. And uh, so I'll be describing um, some of the ways that I was able to get into their systems uh, next week. But I like to have a lot of fun, and especially since I used to be a military aviator, I find it very important for uh, this thing called safety. And unfortunately, if you've read the BBC News today, the BBC said uh, uh, profit over people, uh, which was very unfortunate for Boeing. That's one of the reasons they're angry at me right now. They didn't want more bad press. Uh, this particular book I wrote while I was in a wheelchair earlier this year. Uh, in and out of the hospital. And this one describes hacking IT, IoT, and ICS systems uh, in depth because I like to broaden things and I get bored. You don't want me bored because then it involves like nuclear power plants. You don't want that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions if anybody had questions. And um, yeah, feel free to ask away for about a little bit over nine minutes. I don't want to kill anybody with slides either. So.
see it on the Slido if you have access. Otherwise, we've got the panel at the end, so we can. I've got so many questions because I've just made the link to the Darknet Diaries episode, on the <laughs> and I am like one of the biggest Stuxnet diary, uh, Stuxnet nerds out there. So, so many questions about saving for the panel. Yeah. Go for it. So, with the election coming up in this country, and of course, with all the debate about election security in the U.S., do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, so I just came back from Washington, D.C. I'm uh, one of the German Marshall Fund's technical experts, and what we were working on was a joint EU-U.S. response to malicious cyber activities involving nation-state things like involving election manipulation, involving things that could affect our economy or democracy. And out of those discussions, there will be a public paper uh, actually posted up from the German Marshall Fund. And what was interesting about those discussions was the fact we have seen that we are all major trading block partners. And if one gets highly affected, then it also affects the other countries and other allies. And so we have to work together a lot more. Barring who might be president or who might be prime minister, we have to work together. And uh, yes, we're very concerned, extremely concerned. Because it's happened not just here, when we discuss uh, election manipulation, we've seen it in Bulgaria, we've seen it in France, we've seen it all over the place, even in the Netherlands, where we were having a, a disagreement with the Turkish government. Uh, and so we had election manipulation there as well. So, uh, yes, extremely concerned. Yes. <laughs> Well, there, there's a couple of different ways. Now, uh, I live in the Netherlands, I'm a resident there, and we have, uh, we're the only country that has a coordinated disclosure law, which not only uh, mandates that a company that operates out of there must have a policy, but also that if a security researcher does things through the legal methods, that we are protected. And this is one of the fights I'm having with Boeing, actually. Um, and so you can, you can go so far. There's also an excellent program uh, which I like to use. It's called, I don't know if I like the name though, the FBI Cyber Ninja Program. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I have asked, and, and they have said yes, if you are a UK person, you can also participate. And what they do is they've got a lab that they will put online just for you to test out certain things as well. So if you think you have a proof of concept or you want to just look around, uh, then they'll try to open up that lab for you. You just have to get a, a good time slot. But that's one of the ways. And another one is eBay. If you can find used equipment, on the cheap, you can do that. So, yeah. That's good. How to hack the FBI government. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. They use tech on eBay one just a quick tip. We always see what data you can recover first. That's basically yeah. yeah. Not that. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at eBay, we did write a uh, little bit of uh, information sharing about what you should do before you go. <laughs> I, I can't help that it <laughs> right? Yeah, it's amazing. We did a, the medical hacking village at Hack in the Box in Amsterdam earlier this year, and we purchased a uh, nursing workstation, which is basically just a computer that they make notes. And we found four domains still on there, all sorts of stuff, uh, employee names. We even asked the employees on LinkedIn if they remember their password, you know, as you do. Because it turns out when you're in a hospital, and you sell uh, used equipment, the resellers insist on it being in the same condition, so you cannot wipe it and overwrite it. And then the resellers don't care. So there's a break in that, and that's not the only industry that does that. So eBay's your friend if you want to look at data. <laughs> Amazing. Any other questions? Cool. We'll say some videos for the panel as well. Thank you so much, Chris. That's super.